Tonight we're going to look at the aspects of experimental design. It's going to be really important as we move through these, as we move through labs this year, that you are very comfortable with these concepts and they should come fast and quick and become second nature for you. So when we design an experiment, our focus is going to be on our variables. And our variable is just anything that can change. And when we're designing an experiment, we basically have two variables that we're focused on our independent variable and our dependent variable. So our independent variable and our dependent variable are kind of our um, big things when we're designing an experiment. These are the two things that are both able, again, to change. Constants are going to be our things that stay the same and they never change. Our control group will be our normal or our comparison group. Our experimental group will be the ones that are receiving the independent variable and our retreat repeated trials are just the fact that we are going to repeat the experiment um, more than once we're going to do multiple times okay so let's look at each parts of an experiment each of these six parts of the experiment so our independent variable is the one that you are changing you are changing it on purpose you may have um, heard it referred to as the manipulated a independent or manipulated variable, but this is the one that are you are changing on purpose. It's the cause, it's the reason, it's why, um, why the change would happen. Let's say we were doing an experiment about the growth of plants, if it was related to what um, you watered the plants with. Well, our independent variable would be what we are watering the plants with. Okay, and that would be our independent variable because we can change that, we can manipulate that, we can say we're going to water it with juice, we're going to water it with coffee, we're going to water it with milk, or we could say we're going to water it with tea, and we're going to water it with Gatorade, okay? but those are our choices as the person doing the experiment. And when we go to create our hypothesis, that will be the beginning part of our hypothesis. If I do this, if I change what I'm going to water the plant with, then I think this will happen. And when we are building our graphs, this independent variable goes on the x-axis, okay, which is on the bottom right here. right? So this independent variable always goes on our x-axis when we're building a graph of our data from our experiment. The dependent variable, again, it's a variable, so it is also changing. But your dependent variable is the one that responds. Okay? It's basically, think of it as the one that you are measuring. If I'm doing this experiment about, the, um, about what I water the plants with and if that affects plant growth, then my dependent variable here would be the growth of the plant okay? and whatever units I'm going to measure that in, the growth of the plant in centimeters. That would be my dependent variable. It's the then part of my hypothesis. If I change the substances that I'm going to water a plant with, if I water a plant with something other than plain water, then this is what I think will happen. Then I think it will grow taller. Okay? And so I, that's my dependent variable. When I'm drawing a graph, my dependent variable is always here on my y-axis. Okay? So my dependent variable is on my y, my independence on the x. To help you remember that, you can use the mnemonic dry mix, okay, which is our dependent, sometimes called the responding variable, the one that responds to the stimulus, right? Dependent or responding variable, that's a Y. That was a terrible Y. Okay, I cannot get it to erase, so let's just cross it out. That's a big Y. So our dependent or responding variable is on the Y axis, which means our manipulated, we're going to go sideways here, manipulated or independent variable is on the X axis. Okay, so that can help you remember that. Dry mix, dependent responding on the Y, manipulated or independent on the x-axis. Your constants are all the things in the experiment that you are keeping the same, that you are not changing. 
a, you should have a huge list of constants when you are um, designing your experiment. At minimum, you need to be giving at least three when you are asked for constants. In the example that we have been talking about with watering a plant with different substances, our constants would be things like the amount of liquid. We have to give them all the same amount, whether it's Gatorade, juice, milk, whatever, it has to all be the same amount. Uh, let's see, the type of plant would be a constant. The temperature, the sun exposure, the, um, let's see, how long between waterings. Uh, the amount of fertilizer, the type of soil, all of those things would need to remain constant. Okay? What, you need to be, what you need to make sure you get sorted out in your head is constant versus control. Constant, with the S there, is the same. They don't change. Okay? But our constant is different than the control. So our control group is our standard. It's our normal. It's what we are going to compare to see if our dependent variable actually had, um, if our independent variable actually had an effect on the dependent variable. Okay, so did the independent variable actually affect the dependent variable? So in the example that we've been covering, that we've been talking about with the types of liquid watering the plant and trying to see if that affects the plant growth, our control would be the plant that is receiving plain water because that's normal. So now we can see how tall that plant grows and now if we have a plant that's watered with juice that grows this tall and one that's watered with milk that grows this tall then we can see that compared to normal which is water milk is very good Okay, and juice is not as good. If we did not have our normal to compare it to, we could have a plant, maybe we have a plant that's watered with Gatorade that grows this tall, and a plant that's watered with soda that grows this tall, okay, and we think that those are great, that that plant looks really tall. But then we finally do water a plant with water and it grows like off the charts tall. Okay, so we have to have that normal or that control group, that standard, to compare our experimental groups to. Our experimental groups are the ones that are receiving the treatment. So your experimental groups, okay, again, these are the ones that are receiving the independent variable. So in the example that we've been using, they would be the plants that got juice or the plants that got milk or soda those would all be experimental groups and that's where we would be testing the growth to see how that compares to the control group. And everything else about these groups would be exactly the same. Okay? All of those other things that are, would be exactly the same would be those constants. Okay? So it would be the same type of plant, it would be the same amount of soil, the same amount of liquid fertilizer. Okay, all of those things would remain constant, and the only thing that would be changing would be the independent variable, which would be the type of liquid. And the last thing that you need to keep in mind when you are designing an experiment is that you have to do what we call repeated trials. You have to do the experiment multiple times. The more times you get to do the experiment and get similar, the more valid your experiment becomes. You could do an experiment one time, water a plant with juice, it grows 10 times bigger than the um, water group, and now you're telling everybody that they should water their plants with juice. Yet you do the experiment 99 more times, and 99, the, when you do it those 99 other times, the plant shrivels up and dies. Okay? So you have to do your experiment multiple times to help validate your results. Okay? here where it tells you the more times you repeat the experiment, the more valid your results are. Okay? Valid means that they're true. They're, you're able to argue for them. They're more supported. Okay, so let's look at this example. So this example, I know it's a little bit difficult to see. Okay? This one has four drops of fertilizer, and this one over here, I don't, let's just make it up, it has ten drops of fertilizer. Okay, so as we look at these plants, our independent variable Okay, so our independent variable would be the amount of fertilizer. That's what we're controlling. That's what we can change. So our dependent variable would be plant growth, okay, measuring how tall that the plant is going to be. 
And our constants would be all those things that are staying the same. Water, temperature, type of plant, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit closer. So over here, we have our control group. This was our control group because it had no fertilizer. So we can see how a plant would grow on its own without any kind of fertilizer. All of these, no matter the amount of fertilizer they're receiving, all of those that receive fertilizer are part of the experimental groups. They are receiving, they're getting that independent variable. Whether that's two drops, four drops, or 10 drops, they're getting that independent variable. So now I know how tall it normally would grow. And now I can see when I measure these three out here, I can compare them to this control over here to see if it really made a difference. Because that's what we're trying to see. Does our independent variable really make an impact? Okay, all of these things are gonna be constants. Okay, we've got temperature here, we've got sun exposure, the amount of water they're receiving, the type of pot. You'll notice they're all the same kind of plant. Okay, um, all of those things, and then some, there are other things. The amount of soil you put in the pot the type of soil you put in the pot, the fact that these are mature plants and not like baby plants, all of those things would need to stay constant, which again is very different from the control. Constant, S, same. Okay? If we changed any of these things, let's say we use four different types of plants, or this plant over here got bunches of sun exposure and these three did not. Okay, then we can't say that it's the fertilizer that made it grow. It could have been the sunlight. So we don't want to have those issues. We don't want to have that confusion. We want the only thing that's different between the plants to be the independent variable. That way we can make our claim that the independent variable is the one that caused the change. So here, here are our dependent variables. Our response. How tall did they get? The actual growth. Okay? And when you're talking about your dependent variable, you would always want to add units. So were they measuring this plant in centimeters? Were they measuring it in meters? But we would say plant growth followed by our units. So what if we chose to change our experiment and do the type of soil as opposed to fertilizer? Well now fertilizer becomes a constant. Our independent variable becomes type of soil. And all those other constants also are going to stay the same. Water is still the same, amount of soil, even though you change type of soil, the amount still needs to be the same. Type of plant, size of the pot, how much light, where it's located, temperature surrounding it, all of those things remain constant. And now we're manipulating, the only thing we're changing is the type of soil. Fertilizer, they're either gonna get none or they're all gonna get the same amount, okay? But it would become a constant. And our control, would be whatever normal type of soil that plant would receive. Maybe it's on a farmer's land and that farmer is seeing whether he should change um, some of the soil or add something to the soil. So his control would be his normal typical soil and then he could change the other types. So but that would be your control. You've got, again, you always have to have that normal to compare it to. So once you have identified your independent variable, dependent variable, all those things, now you can form a hypothesis. But to form a hypothesis, you have to have your independent variable and dependent variable. If you don't have those, you can't write a proper hypothesis. So when you are writing your hypothesis, as a general rule, as a general rule we will write them in what we call if-then-because format. If I do this, so if... My independent variable, whatever that is, my independent variable plus a verb. If I add fertilizer to the plants, okay? So if I do this, if I add, there's my verb, fertilizer, my independent variable to the plants, then this is what I think will happen. Then my dependent variable plus a verb, then the plant growth, which is my dependent variable, plus my verb, it will improve. Because, and now you add your science knowledge. Okay? Remember, a hypothesis is an educated 
right? A testable, educated guess. So now we're going to add our science knowledge. If fertilizer is added to the plants, then the plant growth will improve because fertilizer contains nitrogen, and nitrogen is used to help build plant structures. Okay? So that would make plant growth improve. But you need to back up your hypothesis. Yes, that's great that you think that will happen. Why do you think that will happen? What you also need to do, and you need to keep in mind, because remember, we're preparing for AP. You cannot be super vague. Okay? You cannot say, if I change the temperature, then the growth of the plant will change. Great. That doesn't work. You need to make a decision. If I raise the temperature, that's a commitment. Okay? Then the plant will grow larger. Not just that it will change. Okay? You're saying what you're going to do to the independent variable, you're going to test hotter temperatures. And then what do you think those hotter temperatures are going to do specifically? Okay? Let's say you're testing all kinds of temperatures, hotter and, and colder. You might need two hypotheses if you think they will do different things. Okay? So you need to keep that in mind. You cannot be super, super vague. Is it okay for your hypothesis to be wrong? Okay? Absolutely. That is totally okay to have a wrong hypothesis, especially if you've backed it up with your science knowledge. If you have valid science thinking behind why you think this will happen, it is totally okay for it to be wrong. Okay? And your conclusion later will then take care of that. You will explain that your hypothesis didn't, you know, didn't work out, and this is what really happened. Okay, so let's look at what we're doing when finally when we get a hold of a graph. Okay, when we get a hold of a graph, most of your graph, all of your graphs will be worth either five or six points. Okay, you're going to get one point from your title. Okay, and your title needs to be boring and serious. Okay, your title is things like your x-axis versus your y-axis. It is not um, plants, you know, orange juice, orange plants, orange trees are cannibals. You know, they like orange juice. That's not your title. Your title is plant growth versus the type of liquid added. You know, like your title is boring and serious. Okay, and I'm sorry for that. But that's going to be one point. Okay, another point is going to be from your axis label, your y axis label with units. If there are no units, you will not get points. Okay, so you've got to have units here. That's another point. So for instance, with the plant growth one, your units, you would need to write centimeters there. So you have to have units. Another point is your x-axis label. Again, with units, if possible. Units are not always possible, but time, which a lot of times falls on our x-axis, always has units, minutes, seconds, hours. Okay, that's a third point. So we've got three points right there. Okay, a fourth point would be scale. By scale, we mean that you have properly spread out your data along your x and your y axis. Okay, your, your scale needs to remain consistent. You can't go by twos and then switch and go by tens and then go by twos again. Okay, you need to fill at least okay, two-thirds of your graph. So you don't want to draw a little graph that just fills up this little corner over here. You want to spread it out and fill at least two-thirds of your graph. Okay, you absolutely cannot go off your graph. So if you're given a graph of this size and you do a scale that has you putting a data point way out here, okay, that's wrong. You won't get any points. So you need to be consistent with your scale, fill the bulk of your graph, and you can't go over, you can't go off the graph. So there's four points there. Our title, y-axis labeled with units, x-axis labeled with units, and the scale. Okay, the other thing is your data. Did you properly do your data points? Okay, did you plot the data on the graph properly? Okay, and the last one, this one is optional. Okay, and I'm sorry this is getting so messy. My color changer isn't working, so I otherwise I'd be in different colors. And that this is dependent upon your experiment, but that is a key or a legend. If it requires a key or a legend, if you had to draw two lines or three lines, okay, you need to make sure you have one. That will be your sixth point. 
Okay, but those are your points when you are drawing. There it goes working now. Okay, so you've got title, y-axis with units, properly plotted data, scale that is consistent, filling the bulk of the graph, not going off it, y-axis, x-axis label with units, which is our independent variable and our dependent variables, and then optional, if you need it, if you need it, you need to have your key, which also, uh, which explains your graph, key or legend. Okay, these are the skills that we're going to be using every single lab. Okay, these are skills that will carry over into AP, into chemistry, into physics. Okay, so we are going to be talking about them every opportunity that we have.